<clears throat> okay, our speaker today has been um, uh, in the uh, Unity world for over 30 years, and uh, at one time in his illustrious career, he was the music director at San Luis Unity in San Luis Obispo. And then life took him in other directions, and about three years ago, he uh, came back to the Central Coast, and we were so thrilled to have him back, not only because he's just such a wonderful person, but he is an amazing talent, he's a great musician, he's a great teacher, he's, he's a wonderful troubadour, he's whatever, whatever labels you want to plant on this guy, he'll, he probably fits. So I'd like to introduce with pleasure my friend, Richard Inman. Testing one. Oh, I'm on. Good. Okay. Whew. Does, does someone just use the word illustrious when they were describing me? That's, uh, I've never had that happen before. That was impressive. Oh, okay. Oh, boy. I'm really having a good time today. I just, uh, when we, uh, before we, uh, some of the people who talk and the musicians, we get together and do a quick prayer before we come out and we're holding each other's hands. And uh, Therese was leading the prayer and all of a sudden this beautiful uh, glow of energy came over me and just, it was just so like, wow. And it was like, I'm still in a kind of a, Happy stupor. So uh, hope, hope you join me. So the name of today's talk, let's see, it's somewhere somewhere here. Oh, Pass to Heaven. And uh, quite often when I do a talk, I uh, come up with the title of the talk, and then I say, well, I better figure something out to say about this. Because they, they want you to figure out what you're going to say before you get here. Um, and the uh, thing I've noticed is that uh, my spirit, uh, very lazy. Very lazy. My, my higher power uh, waits till the last two days before the talk and says, you need to say this. I'm like, really? I already got a talk. I, I got quotes. Uh, no, this is what you got. It. So now I'm like in this confused state for like a couple hours. I had to figure out. So what is the true meaning of heaven? The expanse of space that seems to be over the earth like a dome. That's the first uh, definition. Two. The dwelling place of the deity and the blessed dead hopes to go to heaven when she dies. Anybody hope to go to heaven when they die? Just me? Okay. Um, and then um, a spiritual state of everlasting communion with God. Let me say that one more time because I read that. I thought, oh, my God, that's going to be hard. That's a hard talk. A spiritual state of everlasting communion with God. I'm going to say it one more time because my mind goes, what was that? A spiritual state of everlasting communion with God. And uh, a couple years ago, I did a talk here, and uh, we were, what I talked about, I'm going to talk about that again today because I think that's, this is the essence of uh, having an everlasting communion with God, is being here now. And uh, it's very easy not to be here now. I'm not here now a lot of the time. And then sometimes I lock into the now and it's great. And then I'm out of it and then I'm in it and then I'm out of it. So um, I would like to uh, uh, elicit your uh, cooperation during this talk. I'm gonna be saying hopefully super intelligent, insightful, amusing things. And you're gonna go away going, wow, that was insightful and amusing. Your job, and I, I want to uh, enroll you in this uh, idea, is to be here now. And if I say something like, uh, the only place God is, is right here, right now. So during the talk, if I see some of you drift off, which I saw two or three people over here, <laughs> they look like they went somewhere else. Uh, you guys are great, by the way. This, is, uh, this group, uh, if you want to see what enlightened looks like, uh, over here is where all the enlightened people are. Um, so if I say the only place heaven is, is right here, right now. Okay, good, good. Okay, you don't have to say it like a, like a German soldier. Uh, and when I say, and when you say it right here and right now, just don't say it robotically. I want you to take a moment 
and this is a little quote from Eckhart Tolle, he says, the moment you realize you are not present, you are present. Whenever you are able to observe your mind, you are no longer trapped in it. Another factor has come in, something that is not of the mind, the witnessing presence. And the only place the witnessing presence is, is Right, so when, that, when, when you do the right here, right now, call and response that we're gonna do during this talk, take a breath and allow yourself to be right here, right now, and just observe yourself for a moment. The moment you realize you are not present, you are present. Something comes in. And I'm, 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 it's like, it seems like I'm constantly doing that all day long. I'm like, are you here now? Are you experiencing this planet? Are you? What, what? Where are you? Come on, come on back. Realize deeply that the present moment is all you ever have. The only place love is, is. The only place healing takes place is. The only place I ever am is. You guys are really good at this. And I, you know, I can feel that uh, when, we, when we do that as a group, there's a there's something that happens. You know, when you get a bunch of people being in the right here, right now, it's electric and energetic. Uh, Gandhi said that when you uh, the power, one person fully in the present moment in the love state can heal the hate of thousands. That's what we're about, I think, in this church is uh, healing the hate of thousands. You know, we would have got 40 people here. Uh, even if we only do 1,000 per person, that's 40,000 people. That's the entire city of San Luis Obispo. We can heal that. And uh, I don't know about you, but if you've ever been around people who are just super enlightened, uh, all of a sudden you're enlightened. You don't know how it happened. What am I doing? How did that happen? And uh, I remember when I first started working, uh, I worked as a psychiatric uh, nurse for many years. And I also wanted to be a, a music therapist because uh, initially my major was uh, voice, classical guitar and composition, which I, I don't know if you've looked on Craigslist, there's not a lot, you never see those people. They never say, hey, we need an opera singer slash classical guitarist, it never happens. So I decided I need to get a better job. So I started studying with this woman who was a uh, music therapist. In fact, I think she was the only working music therapist in San Luis County. And she was up at Atascadero State Hospital. Her name was Tracy, a little short, I don't know, she seemed like, she, I, you know, I always imagine they're only four, she was only four foot tall, but I think she was almost five foot tall, but she was just a short little woman. And she was doing these music programs with um, mentally ill, uh, some are uh, criminally insane people. And, uh, and she was locked up with like 20 guys uh, in a room with no, uh, no one there to save her if things went badly. They give you this little clicker that if something goes bad, you click it and hopefully a bunch of people come and save you. But she was uh she was so in love with her job and the people that she was serving and it was like you you i when i first went out i thought oh you know i i don't think you know about music majors but we're very snooty uh highly evolved people right and we think that uh you know if you don't know who bach is or beethoven uh, who are you you're not that sophisticated she and I, when I went in to study with her, I was like, why am I here with all these crazy people? She created this environment where people were loved and nurtured. And she was one of the great mentors for me. And later I ended up being a, uh, I started some music programs at Atascadero State Hospital. And we had some of the most amazing bands. Oh my, I, I, at one point we had uh, Eric Clapton's drummer, I can Tina Turner's bass player, Tower of Power's keyboard player in my band. These are guys I could never afford to hire on the street. But when we did a show, and they have a big theater there with a thousand, thousand seats, we do these incredible shows. Nobody ever saw them because they won't allow you in the Tascadero State Hospital. And uh, that ability to see uh, the beauty regardless of appearances is what we're required to do. 
in this world, uh, you know, God, I was just thinking about, uh, you know, what was it, two and a half years ago, everything seemed pretty easy. All we had was one crazy president, which was nothing. I mean, compared to what we're doing with now, it's like crazy president, nothing. We always have crazy presidents, but, you know, we, then we had the plague and now we got this crazy war going on and the appearances are very uh, compelling. They want to take your kind. I was watching the news this morning. I got, what are we going to do? Putin's crazy. And uh, I was thinking, uh, what do we do? We go to church and we get in the now because the only time we can dissolve war is yeah, that's, 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 a, that's an interesting concept, isn't it? We think of war as this huge, horrible thing going on, which I'm sure it is. If I was there, I would be experiencing it. But to heal the war that we experience, we have to do that right here and right now. Let's see. I wrote some stuff down here. Oh, here we go. This is an Eckhart Tolle quote. You are not in the now. You are the now. That is your essential identity. The only thing that never changes, life is always now. Now is consciousness, and consciousness is who you are. That's the equation. I found this, uh, you know, when you do these talks, you know, after I've been, I was realizing I've been doing these talks for going on. I guess three years. I don't know. I've done. I, I was adding up. How many hours of talks have you done at this church? It seems like you've been doing these forever. I think I've done like almost ten hours of talks. And uh, after a while, you kind of start running out of gas. What do I get to say? What I've said everything I know. Now what am I going to do? And so you look around and you you look for ways of saying many of the same things over and over again. Um, and this is a, a quote I found that I really love. And it's. Uh, talks about love and forgiveness, which is what Tracy, uh, my, uh, my mentor, uh, exemplified. It's a quote by Hazrat Khan. When we speak of saints or sages, it is not because of their miracles. It is because of their presence and their countenance which radiates vibrations of love. How does this love express itself? In tolerance, in forgiveness, in respect, in overlooking the faults of others. Their sympathy covers the defects of others as if they were their own. They forget their own interest in the interest of others. They do not mind what conditions they are in. Be they high or humble, their foreheads are smiling. To their eyes, everyone is the expression of the beloved, whose name they repeat. And they see the divine in all forms and in all beings. And they exist in the heavenly realm I uh, was thinking about uh, heaven and uh, God, I, uh, Therese said I've been, was doing uh, Unity 30 years ago. Actually, I was doing Unity 34, 44 years ago, 44 year, four years ago. Um, in fact, today, uh, someone in the congregation here came up to me and this happens uh, often for me just because I wrote this song like 40 years ago called to you master and it's become like a unity thing it's in a lot of unity churches and i remember writing that song i wrote three songs that day and i think uh you master just was not my favorite song that day but it's become like richard inman to you master that's the guy who wrote to you master and uh it's it's and people always come up to me and they say oh richard inman wrote to you master they, they look at me like didn't you die like uh, 10 years ago i'm like no, no, actually, I'm, I, last time I looked, I was still alive. And uh, let's see, I've got stuff here. 
So uh, I want to talk about waiting. Um, my great grandma, amazing woman. I mean, she had like 12 kids. I would go into a family reunion was like going to a, like a town hall meeting. I mean, it was like 60, 70 people. That was all these kids. When she was 86 years old, she lived to be 98. Her husband had died, my great grandpa, tiny. Her name was Maud. Believe it or not, Maud Perkins, if you can believe that. And uh, she uh, was at, at Safeway waiting to get a check out on her groceries. And she ran into a man in the line and uh, she married him, 86 years old. And uh, I was thinking, 86, wow, that's, I don't know what goes through your mind when you get married when you're 86. You're like, I still got another uh, 15 good years in my life. <laughs> anyway, I heard some strange statistic the other day, and it, was, it kind of was sobering. It says, if you're 65, anybody 65, would you raise your hand if you're 65 and older? Raise your hand. Hands down, anyone younger than 65? <laughs> wow, okay. Oh, really, you? Sorry. You're, you're the youngest person here? I guess so. I can't believe that. You realize your, be your beard has gone gray. Did you know that? <laughs> um, anyway, she married him, and then I think, he out I think she outlived him. I was like, geez, wow. And uh, I want to talk to you about waiting. Because I used to just hate to wait. I, if there was a long line, I'm like, nah, I'm not doing it. You know, it's like if I go down to the, still even today, if I go down to the uh, farmer's market and there's a long line to get, get a rib, I'm like, no, no, no I'm not going to wait uh, 20 minutes to get a rib. not going to happen. Um, this is an Eckhart Tolle quote that I really love about waiting. So give up waiting as a state of mind. When you catch yourself slipping into waiting, snap out of it. Come into the present moment. Just be and enjoy being. If you are present, there is never any need for you to wait for anything. So next time somebody says, sorry to have kept you waiting, you can reply, that's all right. I wasn't waiting. I was just standing. <laughs> hmm. I uh, think I've got like seven hours of material here. I'm trying to sift through it. Oh, I love this. I don't know why. The, I just love the title of this. Why your, why your life sucks and what you can do about it. And this, this was their answer. I don't even know if it answers the question, but I do like what I like. I like what this says. Loving another person is a gift you give yourself. The love you give flows through you no matter how they respond, you receive the benefit of loving. True love never requires a response. I love that. So um, uh, Janice and I wrote a tune for the choir a couple years ago, and we were rehearsing it for Easter, and then all of a sudden the COVID thing happened, and we were very disappointed. We just loved this tune. It was, we were very inspired by it. The name of the song is uh, Move That Rock. And the lyrics go, move that rock, let the light in for the soul. And then the other chorus is, move that rock, let the love out for the soul. And uh, moving the rock out of the way of being able to be completely here and now in love uh, can be a challenge sometimes. And uh, one of the greatest challenges is resentment. And, uh, you know, most of the time, I don't feel like I'm in resentment, but my dad died in, in December. And uh, dad was a, a soldier in the, the uh, Korean War. And uh, a lot of soldiers came back from war, uh, the various wars that we've been in over the years, and they're still soldiers. They're trained to go out and kill people. That's what soldiers do. And it's very difficult to uh, overcome that impulse to be destructive. And dad was uh, uh, angry and destructive. Uh, when he first came back from Korea, we used to have to wake him up with a broom because he would wake up in this total terror and this uh, very fearful state. And uh, so my childhood was strange in that dad was uh, angry a lot of the time. And... Uh, 
and, you, and, and that, that, that infects your life. I remember one of the things, one of the skills I have, and I still have this skill, is learning to urinate quietly. quietly. <laughs> I, I, would, uh, I would do that so that I wouldn't wake dad up. Because you never know what mood dad would wake up in. And I discovered recently that I still had resentment towards my dad. And so I was talking to a friend about resentment, and we were kind of just examining it and looking at it. And uh, so if anybody have any resentments, anybody uh, feel like somebody's done, 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 done them wrong, and they're still a little peed off about it, um, moving that rock, moving that thing out of the way and experiencing the love and light can be a challenge. What is the true meaning of resentment? Resentment describes the negative emotion reaction to being mistreated. There is no one cause of resentment, but most cases involve an underlying sense of being mistreated or wronged by another person. Experiencing frustration and disappointment is a normal part of life. To resent something is to feel anger or bitterness toward it. You might resent someone who was treated you poorly. To resent is a strong negative feeling. And I was talking this over with a good friend of mine, and uh, this was her response. This just came off the top of her head. And there are some of you who aren't resentful. You've already kind of worked out the whole resentful thing. And this is for you people who have not quite got there. And it, it, it turned on a little light for me, and I'm going to read it for you. This was her response. So I looked up the meaning, and I realized I don't subscribe to this. That was her first line. I don't have a dog in that fight. I don't have a monkey in that circus. I believe that no one can make me feel a certain way. I am in charge of my emotions. Wow! Anybody in charge of their emotions? Raise your hand. Okay, well, uh, some of you guys don't look that, uh, that, you were like, not me. No, I was mad this morning. I believe in perception that we each can perceive a situation to see the good or the bad in it, that I have a choice in how I view any situation. If someone is being negative or mean, I try to accept the fact that their perception is not the same as mine. That's something I'm working on. I keep thinking everybody's like me. They think just like me. And you know what? Everybody in this room has a different way of viewing this reality. And to appreciate that and, uh, and love them for who they are and who they aren't is what we're called to do. You know, quite often I'll look at someone and I'll go, well, they don't have that down and they're not doing that right. And why didn't they well, look at they got this problem? Accepting and loving them for what they aren't. If someone is being negative, I wrote, say, I do not, I do sometimes get disappointed like everyone else, but have to remind myself that their priorities of what is important may not be the same as my priorities. I believe that I am in charge of my life and my decisions, and no one can make me behave or react in a way I don't have to. Therefore, I can't blame others for making me feel a certain way. And as, um, as George Carlin said, don't sweat the petty things and don't, let's see, don't sweat the petty things and don't pet the sweaty things. <laughs> let's see what I got, anything here that's good. Thich Nhat Hanh, who died this year, this was one of his beautiful quotes. The present moment is filled with joy and happiness. If you are attentive, you will see it. The only time we can experience joy and happiness is. Let's let that right here now, right here. As we said earlier in the talk here, if you notice you're not present, you are present. Uh, I heard a great quote, it says, the greatest barrier to being enlightened is the thought that you're not enlightened. When you are here now, that's it. You know, 
doesn't get better than that. The only time you can be happy is. Mm, let's let that set in. The only time we can be happy, joyful, and free is. Yeah, right here, right now. Hmm. And uh, I get upset when I think about war. When I think about people harming each other intentionally. And Eckhart Tolle talks about that, and I thought I'd read this. Can you feel that there is something that is at war, something that feels threatened and wants to survive at all cost? that needs the drama in order to assert its identity as the victorious character within that theatrical production. Can you feel there is something in you that you would rather be right than at peace? Now, if there's that saying, do you wanna be happy or do you wanna be right? Yeah. So uh, we're talking about paths to heaven and one of the great paths of heaven that I've, ex I've experienced is music. And here's a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I've never met Dietrich, but she certainly, or I think Dietrich, is that a male or female name? D male, okay, well, he said this, and it's really uh, true for me. Music will help dissolve your perplexities and purify your character and sensibilities. And in time of care, and sorrow will keep a fountain of joy alive in you. And uh, at this time, I would like to ask uh, uh, Janice to come up and uh, sing a song with me. We, uh, when I first heard the song, I was turning, it was joy, was it, yeah, you wanna, oh, you wanna, you wanna grab a mic stand so we can, they can hear you at home? Okay. Um, I think, was it Joyce Zur who? Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't recall. I recall being in this church hearing this song for the first time. And it truly moved me. I hadn't realized where I stood with myself in this regard. So we're going to sing this song and at the very end and invite you all to join in singing because when I actually sang it, it was quite different than listening to it. I will be gentle with myself. I will be gentle with myself. And I will hold myself like a newborn baby child. I will be tender with my heart. I will be tender with my heart. And I will hold my heart like a newborn baby. And I will only go as fast as the slowest part of me feels safe to go. And I will only go as fast as the slowest part of me feel safe to go. I will be easy on myself. I will be easy on myself. And I will hold myself like a newborn baby child. I will be gentle with myself. I will be gentle with myself. And I will hold 
myself like a newborn baby child. And I will only go as fast as the slowest part of me is safe to go. ourselves an affirmation. I am gentle with myself. I am gentle with myself. And I hold myself like a This. And uh, I'd like to invite you to stick around and eat some food. I saw some really fantastic brownies in there. And uh, for those of you, there's other stuff involved. All right. Okay. Thank you.